The outline for today is to talk about what is digital literacy, what is digital technology, why is it important. We'll talk about uh, what's going on with the digital trans transformation. We'll talk about how does it enhance your life and how does digital technology impact your life, more, near, more importantly, and how can it be beneficial for you. And we'll talk a little bit more about what convergence is, about the internet, the World Wide Web, and the newest thing coming down the pike, which is called the Internet of Things. Okay? They'll give you one over the world about digital technology. Okay? The objective is to, for you to define what it is to be digital literate, to define what digital technology is, to identify those major things that are causing uh, the world to transform into a digital universe. Uh, you'll also be able to identify those things that enhance your life. What's the difference between a wired and wireless network? Um, and what's the telecommunications versus a computer network, as well as uh, how is all that being uh, changed through digital convergence. And finally, we'll talk about the cloud, the internet, and the internet of things. Uh, and you, you should be able to familiarize yourself with that as well. Okay? So what does it mean to be digitally literate? To understand and be able to speak about what? Digital things. Digital things, exactly, exactly. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's about you know, what's going on with the digital world and digital things and how is that impacting me. And, and, and the actual definition says the knowledge skills that deal with a broad range of devices which are networked together. And it's really important that everyone understand that in the digital world today, our devices are no longer independent. They're no longer separate. They are, in fact, networked in some way, in some shape or form, through either a wired or a wireless network. And because of that, they have transformed the way in which we do everything. Uh, and that transformation uh, is primarily because we've made everything digital. Okay? So digital literacy is focused on those skills that people need to have in order to understand the different devices, the different technologies, and how they're networked together. When we talk about digital technology, digital technology starts off with an understanding of what is digital. And when we talk about what is digital, we have to talk about the way in which technology has progressed. Now, if we go back a few years ago, like in the 1970s, um, how did we do things when we wanted to communicate? Telephone. Telephone. Telephone was, was the way in which we communicated. When we spoke into the telephone, it got transferred into a wave like that, an analog way, and we call that an analog system. What happened is that over the course of changing technology, uh, they decided that it would be better to convert this type of a s information system into what's known as a digital information system. They converted this wave form into this type of digital, and then into a digital signal that is just basically a signal that allows it to have representation of ones and zeros. And that's basically what digital technology is about. We've transformed from an analog system to a digital system. And what that's done is made it much more efficient for us to transmit and transfer information from one device to another. Okay? So why is it important? Well, number one, we don't have them any longer, do we? Operators. <laughs> phone operators. How many times have, how many times you picked up a phone and gotten an operator recently? It doesn't happen, okay? Phones are pretty well self uh, self-aware, uh, uh, and as a result, you don't really need an operator. But one of the big things we have seen is a major change in our healthcare system and our uh, health delivery system. And one of the reasons for that is because now they're able to do things diagnostically that they couldn't do before because we have this ability to, in fact, have instruments that are able to monitor and measure what's going on in a person's body much more accurately than we did uh, 50 years ago. And as a result, digital technology is important in that arena. Also, when we talk about digital technology, we also talk about the fact that we can now, through advanced computerization and advanced technology, be able to diagnose a lot more diseases that we couldn't before. And we can come up with new drugs and new things that are available to us, uh, and new uh, regimes that are available to us to, in fact, help us uh, get better and, and, stay, and stay better. As a result, our, our um, life uh, expectancy is increasing uh, for most of the industrialized world. And, that, and that's the direct result of the digital technology that has impacted healthcare. Anybody um, 
look at our cities recently or our in infrastructure? And what do you notice about what's happening with our infrastructure in our cities? You know, if you go down and you, you, you see that we have red light cameras and we have uh, all, all the, all the, stop, uh, all the uh, stop lights are synchronized, okay? And we can have stop lights that allow traffic to move forward in some places, like if you want to get on the beltway, you, have, you can have a stoplight that basically says, okay, you can enter now. So it, it measures the traffic, okay? What's the other thing a lot of people use? Metro. Metro, okay, metro. What's an, another technology that's a digital technology that you might use to get here? To know how to get here? Oh, the Google Maps. The Google Maps, okay. In the car. Uh, In the car, okay. And anything else? How about global, how about GPS? How many people use GPS, okay? Okay, so, so our infrastructure to be able to use those particular types of devices and those different types of technologies has really um, expanded significantly over the last 30 years. As a result, we have a lot more capabilities that we did before. Uh, and even our energy management is now changed because we can manage our energy very well. In Maryland here, what, what's one of the things that the Maryland General Assembly did a couple years ago? Solar. solar, okay. They pushed solar and said, look, if you put solar in there, and I have a couple of friends of mine who have actually they have enough solar panels on their houses that most of the time during the day, they're generating elec enough electricity that they're selling it back to the power company instead of having to pay for it. So, uh, so we, we have a revolution in the way in which we can do uh, power development. One thing I do want to tell you is that, you know, digital literacy and digital training and digital technology is a huge, huge uh, subject. And there's no way that I'm going to cover it all today. There's no way I can cover it all today. And the reason, the reason for... Uh, uh, I, the reason why I, I provide you with this resource is that if you want to, um, there is a website that's called profrenet.com. And this is my website. So profrenet.com is uh, my website that I use to teach all my web classes and all my, all my classes. Uh, here on this particular class is a link to Digital Technology Everything Germantown. And if we click on that particular link on the home page, um, you'll find that there is a classroom site. And this classroom site is for you because I'm only here today. My site is there 24-7, 365. So in this particular site, what you have is you have um, the meeting information, the lesson plan, what we're going to be covering, in-class material. So if you want to download the presentation I'm using today, you can download it at your leisure later on. Uh, uh, there's some class exercises there. There are also a lot of videos on different things like data brokers, social media, digital footprint, VPNs. And we'll see some of these videos today. These are all on my website. Okay. The other thing I also have is, it's, is the support links. So my, di my, my, my digital literacy and my digital technology classes cover so many areas that I really have to provide you with additional resources to be able to, to look things up and, 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 and uh, get that information on your own. So what I've done is I put together some specific links here and specific information, things like technical terms and jargon and acronyms and, and those types of things. So when someone uses something, they, you can come here and say, oh, well, that's what it meant, and this is what it means. Digital literacy links, encryption products and services, computed devices, com cloud computing infrastructure, cloud storage, cloud office applications, cloud social media, cloud um, music services, cloud video, e-learning the discovery, opting out, secure email services, and how browsers work. So these are all the different links that I have here um, that are available for you to go through at any time because, again, I'm not here. I'm only here today. This is here 24-7, 365. If there's something you also think I need to cover and include in my digital links, please let me know, and I will then research it, find the best available information on the Internet, and put it down as a link for you to have later on down. This uh, site, additionally, is for, available for you, again, I never take it down. It's, it's free and open, so there's no, no uh, problem with you using it at any time you want to. So what are the drivers that have allowed us and are forcing us to move to this new digital world? You need to understand these drivers because these drivers have a direct impact in your life and the fact that there are things you could do before that you can't do because digital technology has, has assumed them. Okay? So one of the big things that's happening is robotics. One of the things I showed you in the little film that I showed you earlier is the fact that a lot of what's going on in the world is being 
changed by robots taking over those particular things. As, as you see, Amazon.com has now 40,000 robots working in their warehouses. That mean, means a loss of significant amount of jobs. UPS is in the same way. Uh, Walmart is doing the same thing. So all this digitalization of information and digital technology is having a big effect. Okay? Um, we take a look at factories. We take a look at things like the Tesla, fac the te Tesla factory. Machine learning is another big thing. We're now having the ability of expert systems to, in fact, do things. When you call up a bank today, do you get a bank teller? What do they want you to do? Press two for this. Press two for this. Press three. You know, press. Well, that's the, that's what we, that's what we call an expert system. An expert system says, "Hey, the system knows exactly what you need to do, and it has a menu of all these things you can go through." So it eliminates the need for, to have a, 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 a local operator to, in fact, have you that capability. Okay. Uh, quantum analytics. One of the big things that's happening is big data. Big data is allowing us to do a lot more in terms of what consumers need because we can now match consumer requirements up with where the, that information or where that product or where that service is. And as a result, analytics is driving a lot of what's happening in, um, in the business world today. One of the things that's happening also is in, in, the field of, um, in the field of medicine is the fact that we are now getting to a point where we can actually be doing predictive um, diagnostics and predictive, uh, uh, predictive medicine and what that's doing is increasing the human longevity of individuals because we're able to see uh, those particular diseases and disease agents faster and then come up with therapies to in fact el eliminate them and allow individuals to be uh, to have a longer extended lifetime. Um, enhanced intelligence. Uh, one of the big things that's happening now is that with the rapid uh, amount of information that's being handled and being produced on a yearly basis our ability to, to understand that, to synthesize it, is really putting a, t a, 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 a premium on being able to, in fact, have the ability to increase our knowledge base. And as a result, uh, uh, educational institutions are, are, are now uh, developing curriculum that's going to that allows people to have that capability. So those, these are all the transformations. That, because all of this information now is being transformed into digital. And digital means that I can take it anywhere, do anything with it and have it available to me. So how does it impact you? Well, one of the things is we now know that there are people that we might consider to be digital residents in the, today's world as opposed to digital visitors. So how would you classify yourself? Digital resident or digital visitor? In between. In between? <laughs> A resident of what? Of the digital world. Oh. In between the two. In between the two, OK. In between the two. Well, you see. One of, the, one of the things about, about being digital visitors and digital residents is the fact that um, you know, kids today, they grew, up, they grew up in this world. And it's like everything becomes easy for them because they know it. But think back. Think about your parents. Your parents grew up in a world where they didn't have telephones. They didn't have you know, colored TVs and things of that nature. And as a result, guess what? You know, today's world is just as radical as it can, can be as it is for you, given all the digital technology that we now have. So again, technology has sped up our ability to, 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 to see that. One of the things that's also happened is that consumers now are no longer just passively involved with what happens with information. Consumers now have become uh, a very, very big commodity for companies because the information they provide is valuable. And as a result, consumers and what they do and how they do things has become a commodi commoditized product. So as a result, consumers have become products that companies are now monetizing. Okay. Worker disintermediation, uh, uh, I don't have to tell you that's been a big issue going forward. Uh, accelerated human adaptation, continual re education training. One of the things you're here today is you're coming to, to a class to be re-educated and retrained about what's going on in this new world so you have a better understanding of what's happening. And finally, uh, digital data security is changing the way in which we do things. And the human asset is changing from being an asset that is able to do labor and have labor as it turns an asset that is able to do imaginative things and develop and create new things. Okay? So this is what we're dealing with today. We're dealing with young people who today intuitively know how to work with digital devices. Okay? I mean, it's, it's amazing. You, you put an a, 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 a iPad in front of a 
and, and they have no problem touching it. And eventually they will learn how to operate that. As, as young as, you know, four months old. We now know that they become digital residents the day that they are born. As opposed to some people who still are struggling with those, the digital technology that's out there. So the question is, how do we bridge the gap between those groups of people who are digital residents and those people who are digital visitors? One of the big things is to be able to provide the training and the experience and operations that's necessary for them to understand those particular items. Okay? Consumers as products. How many people have one of these? Which one of what? One of these. A member rewards program. Okay, which one do you might, which one might you have? Oh, I have Starbucks. Starbucks, okay, <laughs> Starbucks, okay. Anyone else have a member's reward? A member is a member rewards program. Oh, all kinds of programs. Anybody use these at the store? That's a little. Uh, they're they're swiping your card at the store. Okay. With phone numbers now. Well, well, phone. Well, they use phone numbers too. Okay. Yeah. So anybody have a shopping rewards program? CVS. You know, CVS yeah. All of you, okay? Yeah. What, why, why are they requiring you? You go to buy something today, they're requiring you to do what? Uh, Phone zip number, code. zip code, right. all this information. And why do you think that's the, why do you think that's the case? I'm trying to learn about you. Trying to learn about as you. As a consumer. As a consumer, okay. Advertise. Yeah. Advertise. Well, one of the things that's happened is that, and, 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 and one of the things that people need to understand is that, you know, consumers have become productized. And the reason why they've become productized is because, and the, the, the reason given is because we can, the more we know about you, the easier it is for me, us to provide products and services to do, okay? Um, to a certain degree, that's true, but most apps and most information that you're giving to, con to uh, vendors and to businesses is a secondary source of income for them. And that source of income is allowed to be shared with advertisers and marketers to be able to know what affinity group you might belong to and what that affinity group is buying, how they're buying it, and what their other data points are about them. So one of the things you have to remember is that as you go through and as you provide digital information to the different merchants that are out there, recognize that that information is now providing them with another source of income, okay, because you've become the product. And that makes it easier for them to target their advertising because you've personalized and customized that information for them. Okay? So, worker dissemination. Everyone remember these? Oh, type writers? Typing pools. Typing pools. Okay. My, my mother was, was a member of Titan Pool up in New York. And, um, you know, she, for years, did this type of work. And then all of a sudden, what came along is this little device. Anybody know what that device is? It's called a Wang computer, a Wang word processor. It was the first major word processor that was out there. And the Wang word processor replaced a lot of typing pools, okay? And then all of a sudden, the word processor just wasn't good enough. We had to be able to have our personal assistant who was, be, who was the, the, the person that was out there. And then we got to a group assistant, and now we have what's known as a virtual assistant. Our virtual assistant is actually there with us 24-7, 365. It's part of our mobile devices and could be part of our devices that are part of. Um, I remember mm -hmm. one summer in college, I worked for Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. It was in a room a little bigger than this, and in the middle, not middle, but almost the whole thing was something that was called a computer. <laughs> it was the first time I ever heard the word, and I was doing all these things the summer job. I had no idea that that was something that you know, what's going to go to because I didn't even understand what I was doing. <laughs> That's related, right? It is related. It is related, yes. And I, I remember one of my first jobs, they had a computer room, and it was up on a, the floor was on a platform. Right. Mm -hmm. And everything was underneath it, all these cords and things, huge. They called it a wiring tunnel. What was it? A, wi a wiring tunnel. A wiring so what happened is that that was, back, that was back when you had IBM 360 computers. And one of the reasons why you had to raise floor is that your wiring for all of the computers had to be underneath the floor. The other second reason, which a lot of people didn't understand, is that computers, because they ran hot, because they were doing a lot of calculations and because they had a lot of tubes and they, and they had a lot of different electronic uh, devices in them, the computers would get warm. And in order to keep them efficiently running, you had to keep the temperature down. So what happens with the raised floors is they were using it for air conditioning. 
So the air conditioning was being pushed out. Yeah. So, 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 so that's the reason why they did that. But one of the big things now is that we have these new devices and these new capabilities called virtual assistants. And anybody know have a virtual assistant at home? Maybe. What is it? A virtual assistant is something that helps you out to schedule things and do other things. Okay, they can print things out for you. So anyone here, everyone, anyone ever hear of a thing called Alexa? I was just <laughs> exactly. So Alexa is a personal assistant. Okay, a virtual virtual personal assistant. Yeah. The other thing we need to think about is the fact that human adaptation is really changing, and. What we mean by that is the fact that we now have the ability to, in fact, provide life-saving uh, therapies and uh, drugs to individuals to extend their lifetime much greater than what we did 50 years ago. Okay? We also have the ability to, in fact, increase the capabilities of hu human, humans to make them more uh, efficient and to make them more cap capable of doing things. Uh, we haven't gotten to this point yet. Uh, we haven't been borgified yet. But, you know, the day will come when we might get vulgarified as far as that's concerned. But we do have a lot of capabilities now, particularly for individuals who come back from the war, who have lost their legs. We now have uh, um, um, those particular um, um, uh, prosthetic devices now that are tremendous in terms of being able to be used uh, for, that in the, for the individuals. So one of the things we're able also to, be able to do is with the, di with the diagnostic capabilities to identify those particular uh, genetic traits that also are um, a problem and we can do things and have therapies to change them faster. So um, one of the other things we have to worry about that the digital system is requiring us to do is to go back to school. Today the average person will no longer have a job for 30 years. It'll be a job, it'll be a continued changing because the workforce requires it because what we have today to get, to get done is not going to be what we need tomorrow. I've been through four different careers in my lifetime. I started off as a, as a power system engineer working on nuclear power plants, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and now I'm teaching information technology. And I was, a, I was uh, at, at one time a, uh, a, a digital scientist, and before that I was involved with a digital video and production. So I've had four different careers in my lifetime, okay? You got it at the bottom of some stuff. Excuse me? You got it at the of many good things. Well, well, yes. I mean, the thing about it is that, but, th but there are many good things happening today that's brand new that we didn't know about before, okay? And as a result, one of the things that's happening, students who are younger today have to be adaptable because they are going to go through 16, 20, you know, 20 different jobs over the next years. Um, the other thing, because we're living longer, older Americans are going to have to work longer. Sim that's the simple fact of the matter, okay? I mean, um, the retirement systems are not there any longer. You know, you have 401ks and all the rest, but we didn't expect to live into our 90s and hundreds, okay? We have centurions now in the, in the dozens when we used to have only one or two. The thing about it is that as the human longevity gets extended further and further, it'll be easier for individuals because they're able and, and, and have the mental capacity to continue to work into their 70s and 80s. Let's face it, our president is how old? Okay. So, <laughs> so the thing about it is that there will, be, there, there will be a need to continually retrain ourselves, to continually new, learn new things. And as a result, one of the big things that's going to happen is older Americans have to go back and begin and learn a new skill because that will make them employable. I have people in my, um, in my uh, uh, web development class, all, all older American, who are coming back and say, look, I really want to be able to do this because I have a club that I'm working for. I have this that I'm working for. I have a cause that I want to work for, and I want to know how to do these things. Well, they come back to, school to, school to get retrained because that's necessary for their life enhancement. And that's, that's a great thing. But digital technology is part of that evolution of what's happening to them as well as the world around them. One of the things we also need to think about today is the fact that now that our livelihood and now that our lives have become more digitized, Digital security and privacy is a big issue, okay? Uh, I don't have to tell you that we, uh, we have a, a tremendous uh, requirement in front of us to be able to have de digital data security as well as the ability for it to be adaptive to and provide us with the security and privacy that we have. There's also other regimes that need to be put into place. To give an example, the European Union just approved a new law for the European Union citizens that really significantly changed the the, the, the way in which digital security and privacy is in fact implemented and 
uh, going forward the consumer is involved with. So the thing about it is that uh, we're going to have adaptive digital security going forward as a result of these new capabilities and these new regimes go going into place. But when you come back to it all, one of the things we have not been able to change through all this digitization is the fact that we still need humans to be able to be intuitive as well as imaginative because it's the imagination and the intuition that allows us to develop new things. And that's where our, our really biggest gain is. We have not been able to, to digitize that capability. And that's where the human element comes in really big time. Okay? So at the end of this thing, in, intuition and imagination, imagination is still one of the major human elements that we uh, will be able to fall back on uh, that, that is not going to be digitized, that is going to be strictly something that we need to really focus on. So let's see, look, let's take a look at another video. Once upon a time, business as usual was often good enough. No more. Where we are going, good enough is dead. In a world where everything is connected, where everything is equally excellent, where performance is reaching perfection, there's only one space left to innovate in. You. Right now, you are a central point in the raging tornado of change fueled by digitization, mobilization, augmentation, disintermediation, automation. Well, the list goes on. Science fiction is becoming science fact. Think about self-driving cars or computers that can learn and think. The way we work will never be the same. The skills we need will be dramatically different. Winning or losing are now happening faster than ever before. So what's your response? How will you discover new opportunities in one of the most transformational times in human history? Are you driving change or are you being driven by it? Disruption has become the new normal. With change, it's always gradually, then suddenly, well, things really have stopped happening gradually. This change is exponential. Everything that used to be dumb and disconnected is now wired and intelligent. Cars, cities, ports, farms, even our bodies will be wired with sensors and will talk to each other. These game changers are also combinatorial. They amplify each other, creating a perfect storm of change. Quantum computing fuels big data. The Internet of Things fuels artificial intelligence and deep learning, which fuels robotics. However, anything that cannot be digitized or automated will become extremely valuable. Human-only traits such as creativity, imagination, intuition, emotion, and ethics will be even more important in the future because machines are very good at simulating but not at being. Yes, robots and software will do some of our work, but this will allow us to focus on things that cannot be automated. To imagine change squared, you've got to start engaging more with what might be, not just with what is. Immerse yourself in the immediate future, five to seven years out from today. We need to go beyond technology and data to reach human insights and wisdom. Technology represents the how of change, but humans represent the why. The future is about holistic business model. The opportunity is to be liquid, to learn just in time, not just in case, not single improvements, but complete transformations, not individual systems, but new ecosystems. Humanity is where true and lasting value is created. We will engage, relate, and buy things because of the experiences they provide, because of their transformative power. The future doesn't just happen, the future gets happened. The new way to work is to embrace technology, but not to become it. The future is in technology, yet the bigger future lies in transcending it. Let's live and lead from here. So that's a quick video from Gerd Leonard. He's a futurist and one of the thought leaders 
uh, involved in the digital transformation process and how uh, individuals are involved with that. Um, so what is the impact of digital technology on your life? How's it impacted you? Well, I'm very interested in information and I found that I can pretty much Google anything I want to. <laughs> Pretty great. Yeah. So, what used to take weeks now can be found out in a matter of seconds, right? Well, the biggest thing it has affected me is when I was in kids and grandkids, because I, if I didn't have them not just pushing me to, to learn at all, but just talking about things, and Grandma, why can't you do what? my little five-year-old brother can do, you know, I wouldn't realize, realize everything that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested to mm -hmm. push me to find out. One of the things that's happened is the fact that because of these new digital technologies and these new uh, digital capabilities, we do have a much more enhanced life. Like you said, your grandchildren, they are able to talk with you and, 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 sh and show you that there is a different thing out there. You, you're now able to get information that used to take how long before? Well, it depends what kind of information you're looking for, mm -hmm. but it could take, I mean, if you're doing a research paper, uh, you just can get, you can get information from a university library. Right. Minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You'd have to go there. <laughs> right. You have to go there and, and look through the stacks and, <laughs> and, 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 and do all of that. Stacks, so, yeah. so. I think also health. As you get older, you're, you're looking for more and more <laughs> health things. Of course, yeah. And if you're interested in world news, my God, you know, everything's yeah. right there. Right. But are you able to find a lot more health information in terms of uh, what's out there and what's available? Yeah. 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 Have we become our own doctors? Well, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> you have to use caution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have, a, I have a, a friend of mine who, you know, they can't go on the internet because every time they go on the internet and look up a disease, it's like, I got this disease, you know? And I'm saying, no, you don't. <laughs> you need to go to, go, to, go to a real live doctor to find out what you've got. So, so there's a, there's a, there's a two-edged two sword, okay? Yeah. And look at the, the good sites, not the advertisements of medicine. Don't take this if mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's really yeah. One of the, one of the key things about digital literacy that is is a big big training um, um, uh, issue is how do you t teach students and anyone who's doing digital research what's what is valid and what's an invalid? Okay, and, that, and that's a big thing. And of course, you know, we had this other issue that came up called fake news. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so as a result, you know, we have to we have to worry about you know what is actually being done. Yeah. You know, because we know that, you know, there could be some rogue agents out there that might be giving us some fake news or influencing the news. In any case, one of the big things that we were able to do is notice that in the last week and a half in the Washington, D.C. area, what's happened? Rain. 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 Torrential rain, okay? And our meteorologists have done a better job of warning us and telling us what's happily happening because the amount of information that they have to analyze is huge and now that we have the ability to analyze it through our big data capabilities they can do a much better predictive job so our our um, our uh, satisfaction and our expectation of meteorologists has gone up significantly it used to be that a meteorologist was 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 right 10 percent of the time we thought they were great now we're looking at 50 percent of the time people want to see that their so weather is a big thing um, anybody know what this is No, bottom picture. This, this uh, one, this one I just right here. Okay. Zeros. Excuse me? Zeros and ones. Actually, that's an assay that basically breaks down what is going on with your uh, DNA. So that's the way in which you do it, have a DNA analysis. So one of the things we now know with DNA analysis is we can do a lot more in terms of predictive health care because we can say, based upon these particular traits and these particular items, based upon a DNA strand, we, can, we know that the BRCA gene-like and, and all those other things are things that we can do to, in fact, uh, increase our <coughs> health, health capability. Anybody know what this is? MRI. MRI, MRI, <laughs> Magnetic Resonant Imaging System. One of the coolest inventions to come about in this last th 30 years. We now are doing things that we couldn't do before. We're now seeing structures that we can't be. And I want to tell you something. One of the things that 
is going to come down as a result of MRI imaging is the things called volumetric imaging, where people are going to be able to take a three-dimensional view of your heart or whatever structure you have in your body and actually allow them, um, um, surgeons, to in fact use that as a diagnostic tool as well as a pre-surgical tool to know exactly how to do certain things to help uh, 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 heal individuals and to help them do things because our diagnostic capabilities through digital technology is rapidly, rapidly going f faster than what we ever expected. And of course, weather reporting is another big thing. Okay. So, how can it, how can digital technology enhance your life? Well, this is going to be one of the big areas that enhances your life already, and will enhance it even further. Anybody know what that is? Looks like a car. Looks like a car. It's flying. I don't think it's flying yet, but it self -driving. is. Self-driving. Self-driving. Okay. So self-driving cars. What do you think of that? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. One of the things we're going to have, we're going to have a lot of self-driving cars on the, on the, and you know, believe it or not, it won't be personal vehicles. What do you think? It's going to be commercial vehicles. Mm -hmm. The reason being is because it's going to be a lot easier for us to ship things across transit with a commercial vehicle system that's automatic, okay? because it'll be able to stop when there's traffic. It'll be able to go on when, when there's no traffic. Uh, right now, the Dutch have a complete automotive uh, uh, self-driving system on their ro roads. It's been there for five years now. It's, it's, it's something that's going to be taking over in, in, in a big way. We call that what we call vehicle telematics. And vehicle telematics is where we have remote sensing and, and, and remote capabilities to do all the what needs to be done. One of the things that's happening with your cars today is we also have a lot more uh, diagnostic capabilities with remote sensing. Have you ever noticed that your, 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 your auto uh, dealerships or your auto repair guy now knows, hey, look, you're doing for a diagnostic on this. We noticed that, you know, we, based upon the information we got from your car last time, that you're going to have to have these particular items done. We now are able to get that done because of digital technology and because we measure it. We have some cars that are being rolled off the line right now that will tell you whether or not your you, you, um, tires need air because it knows exactly based upon some um, digital technology if your tires need some air. Okay? One of the big areas that we have a significant impact in our life is the fact that we are you know, a country that has taken for granted the ability to have clean water and a um, sewage treatment system. One of the things I did when I was in the military was I did disaster relief work. And I, as a power guy, I went out and used to, used to provide electrical power to disaster areas. And that's the first thing you notice is when you go to a disaster area and everything's gone, um, the first thing you got to do is you got to get the uh, sewage lift pump pumps working again. So one of the things you have to do, because the minute you have sewage just you know, spilling out into the roadway and things like that, it's a very, very big health disaster. One of the things that's happened in the United States is the fact that our sewage treatment systems and our water systems now are able to look and see pathogens well before they even get to the point where they're passed on to the average citizen and the average household because we have these early monitoring systems which have been digitized and with the digitization allows us to uh, spot them very, very fast. Okay? So that's another area we have. Traffic. We've talked about traffic, but also the, we also have now the ability to have uh, so, so surveillance uh, and surveillance capability uh, with the amount of traffic cams and cameras that we have. And in the United States, we don't have a lot here, but in, internationally, there are some cities where there are as many as, as uh, two cameras uh, per density per block, okay, for all those. London is, is a good example, okay? So as a result, we have a much better crime-fighting capability because we're able to spot those particular things. And we can also do a lot more data analytics because now we have, we have a way of capturing what is going on as far as that's concerned, okay? Electronic commerce. How many people shop online? You shop online? You shop online? You shop online? Amazon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A bit, a bit, a bit. Has that been a boon to you? Has it been helpful to you? It's encouraging to do it more. <laughs> I have to learn more. It's a good, you know, I, I can't tell you the amount of times that I've said, I don't want to go to a mall. And, and in fact, malls are dying because of the fact that e-commerce has taken over, okay? But one of the big things about e-commerce is the fact that it allows us to have the ability to, be, to have access to a, just a tremendous amount of information and uh, products that are out there. And what's one of the one things, if you're a digital shopper, what's one of the things you hate about being a good digital shopper? If, and you, 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 even if you're not a digital shopper, but a shopper, 
What's one of the things that you, you, you definitely do not like as a shopper? I feel guilty. You feel guilty? <laughs> yes. Because I'm making, I'm closing down on the store. Oh, yeah? Oh, you feel guilty because you're closing down. Oh, well, guilty in that way. But, but as a shopper, what, what's one of the things you really... You can't ch ch try things on. You can't, but, but I mean, just as a shopper, not a digital shopper, but just as a shopper, what's one of the things that always is a driving issue for you when you go shopping? At least for me, it is. Save money. You, you, everyone, wants to, everyone wants to save money. Yeah. So what's the one of the things as a shopper you're always looking for? Sales. Sales. Best price, right? You always shop by best price, okay? If, the, if everything's the same, you know, if the, if the dress is the same, if the shoes are basically the same, I want to get the cheapest amount, right? And what's the worst thing that can happen to you? Absolutely. It just drives you. Shop price. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You go to some place, and the next day it's off 20%. And you could have just waited one day and gotten it for 20% off. That, people hate that, okay? The nice thing about the internet is the internet allows you to have the ability to see and price compare very quickly, number one. But number two, it can alert you because the consumer, the, the, uh, the e-commerce site now, knows enough about you to say, look, if you're planning on buying this item because we noticed you've been shopping around, wait for two days and we're going to have it on sale for this amount. And it can send you an alert to, give you, to save you money. Okay? So, by personalization and customization, that's a big thing that we have the ability to be able to do now with the new e-commerce. And that's one of the things that enhances your life is the ability to save money and to get the things you want by customizing. Okay? So in order for us to understand what we're talking about, we need to talk about what are computing devices. Okay? So let's get a little bit into the, into the technology. We're going to now transition from those things that are kind of good for you, but talk about what, what so when we talk about a computing device, everybody know what this was? You see that? So adding or the calculator? The calculator, right. First thing that we really started using as a digital computer was a calculator, personally. You know, companies had the big IBM 360s and those big machines, but for us, the, most, the first time we got it introduced into something digital and the computing capability was a digital calculator. How many people had a digital calculator 20 years ago? Did, did you have a calculator? Okay, so the question is, if you had a calculator, was it digital? Probably. <laughs> yeah, because it had to change everything into digits, into ones and zeros, and it had to digitize that in order to be able to have that capability. So 20 years ago, were you doing digital computing? If you were using a calculator? 20 years ago, exactly. This year, I got a computer. I don't know that I ever had a small. You never had a small calculator? I had a calculator, but... I don't know if it was really... But you had a calculator, right? Yeah, a calculator. Okay, so calculators, those calculators back then were still digital. That was probably the first time you had a digital device that was using a computerized capability to be able to do calculations, okay? How about this? Anybody use these? Yeah, digital cameras. Digital cameras, okay. So, how do you use your digital cameras today? And what what oh, digital well, cameras do you use? Well, do you have a separate well, digital camera? Your phone, your phone, right? Yeah. Your phone. Everybody has a phone now. How many people have a smartphone? And have a, have a camera set up with it, okay? Mm -hmm. Everyone does today. And that's radically changed. Radical change. Because what, what did we used to do with phones before? What with cameras before? We had to take them down, get the film developed. It was a Polaroid. You get them immediately, but all that's gone now, okay? Okay. We talk about uh, these particular things. This is what's known as a set-top box for your systems, your set-top box does what for you? Uh, it, could be, it could be include a VCR, but a set-top box is primarily for your cable system to be able to provide you with digital entertainment. It brings it into your house, okay? okay? So, anybody know what that is? A GPS. 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 So these are all digital computing devices. That has been a huge difference. Oh, yeah, a huge difference. Yeah. Okay. Um, our digital meters that we might be using, our digital arrays to be able to determine and get information for us, things like a VCR. How about this? Anybody have a watch that's smart? <laughs> okay. I noticed, I noticed you, you're wearing one and I'm wearing one, okay? I mean, and what does that do for us? That allows us to have all of our biometrics digitized. So we can, we can keep track of what's going on, okay? In-car di da dashes that now have entertainment systems, that have diagnostic capability, that have GPS capability, we call that vehicle telematics, 
vehicle telematics, okay? And finally, we have other different types of devices that are doing remote monitoring, such as security systems and all the rest, okay? These are all examples of digital computing devices. One of the big areas that's been tremendous is in terms of, of exploding for us is what we call mobile computing and mobile devices. Mobile computing has really taken off in terms of uh, what is available because of digitization. Digitization has allowed us to miniaturize the computer and the things that make up a computer to be able to have those things available to, to us in a mobile environment. Okay? So also connected to digital computing is also the fact that we now connect all this digital information through a network. And that network is called a digital network. So there's basically a couple different things we need to know about networks and digital networks. The fact that there is a difference between an analog and a digital network. Um, and it used to be that the telephone network and the radio network, the television network, was all an analog network. And when we talk about analog, we're talking about a frequency wave that something looks like that. Well, as I said, one of the things that happens is we sample this wave now, and we come up with a uh, digital output, and that digital output is changed to allow us to have this type of an output. So it's much better in terms of its uh, uh, usability and in terms of being able to uh, have that information uh, rapidly uh, stored in a much more um, concise way. Okay. This thing you're talking about is that a wave? Yeah. So it used to be when so we used to be like right now I'm talking and the audio is picking up my voice and that's in a waveform. Okay. The waveform is then going to be sampled and the sampling is then going to be changed. It's going to be sampled. It's going to be changed into a, a ones and zeros uh, on and off and then it's going to be made into a digital file or digital storage capability. And that's going to be the same thing that you see here, except it's been converted to a digital capability. That's what we mean by going digital. We're taking analog and we're converting it. Okay? So we did that with the telephone network because the telephone network used to be what? When you picked up the phone and you called someone, you called them, and it was primarily an analog system that went all the way through. Um, our radio broadcasting network was analog okay, for a long time. Our television network, when we, when, we, when we watched television prior to 1998, our television network was what? Was, how did, how did, how did we get a television? Antennas. And antennas, right. Well, antennas were primarily an analog signal, okay? It was a, a wave signal. And, this, and it would be picked up in the television. Now, to how to, now, now how do we get our television, our TV? Through wireless. Through wireless or, or through... A, a, a cable network, or we can actually get our television through what a big changeover happened a couple of years ago. A big changeover happened with the tele television network a few days, a few years ago. We had to get rid of all of our rabbit ears, right? Right. And we had to go to what? Well, it's like a, it used to be a, a modem. A modem, okay. But, but for our broadcast TV, what used to be rabbit ears, now we no longer use rabbit ears. We use a specific type of digital antenna because our system went from an analog TV system to a digital TV system because now we have DTV, digital television, okay, as opposed to analog television. So we made a complete changeover. And one of the reasons for that is because we had to be able to use different, different, different frequency spectra. So these particular items transitioned us from an analog network into a, uh, a, a digital network. And those digital networks allow us to have the ability to have much more information placed in a smaller area and stored in a smaller time period. Okay? There are basically two components. Uh, there are basically different components to the different types of networks that we have. We still, our networks are primarily two ways. We have a wired network and we have a wireless network. Both networks allow us to interconnect information and take this digital information and send it over those networks. A wired network is made up of a network interface card, which is something in your computer that allows you to connect and to a wired information service. And you can connect through different cables. So how many people have um, Comcast cable at their house? Okay. Xfinity. Xfinity, right. Xfinity. Xfinity cable. How many people have uh, um, Verizon Fios? You have Fios. Great, great example here. We have, we have Fios and we have Comcast, okay? So we're two different types of things. One, 
uses a cable like this. The other one uses a cable, a coaxial cable. They're both networked and they're both hardwired cable systems and hardwired networks, but they use completely different technologies. One, the cable system, the Comcast group uses a thing called DOCSIS, which is data over cable specification. Whereas the uh, Xfinity, I mean, not the Xfinity, but the um, uh, Fios is an actual digital system that uses the uh, interconnection capability of the internet. And one of the things that, that's, that's nice about that is that there's no transition from a different system to the internet because it's the same type of, type of uh, transmission system, whereas opposed to the um, DOCSIS system, there has to be a conversion done. Okay? But in, in any case, these particular cables connect our systems to a router of some type. How many people have a router at their house? You have a wireless router? You have a router? And once we get to a router, we might go up to a hub. The hub can be things that might be in a network neighborhood. It could be a neighborhood hub. It could be a, a housing hub. And basically allows many different computers and many different networks to get connected. We go, might go to a switch. In this particular case, the switch allows us to change the type of network we're going to. So if we're going to go from an internet to a Comcast network, we have a switch that switches that out. And then we go to a Fios hub. If it's a Fios hub that you're going to be using, it's a Fios hub in your neighborhood. Or we'll go to a, a, a cable hub. A cable hub looks like this little round box that's in your neighborhood. The difference between the two is that with the Fios system, which is an internet network system, everybody has their own individual line. With a cable hub, it is a shared resource. So you're sharing that particular information service with all the other people in that particular neighborhood. And then we'll generally go to some other different item. It could go to a satellite umbling. It could go back to a main center, whatever it might be. But this is all connected via a wired or via a cable. You connect into those particular items, and everything is connected to a cable. Now, how many people have a home computer that's connected to a cable to your cable box? In other words, do you have a home computer that's connected to your, to your cable box? Or, do you, or is your home computer connected wirelessly? Wireless. wireless. I don't know. So what type of computer do you have at home? What type? What type of computer? Do you have a laptop? Do you have a tablet? Do you have a laptop? De desktop? Do you have a desktop computer? Yeah. Okay. Desktop. Is, it, is the desktop connected to via wire or wireless? That's that's what you need to go home and take a look at, OK? Because you need to figure out if it's a wired network connection or is it a wireless network connection. It has wires. It has wires. But does, but does the connection from that, that computer connect back to a router of some type, OK? Does it directly connect with a cable? I would guess not. You would guess not. It's upstairs versus everything else is downstairs. OK, so it's probably a wireless connection, OK? OK, but you might have a computer that, downstairs or, or wherever it is that connects directly with a cable. But you might not as well, okay? The thing about it is that this allows you to understand that when you have a wired network, you're gonna have some type of cable that connects those devices together, those digital devices together. Today, because we have another different way of connecting devices together, we have another thing that's called wireless. And wireless involves us, with a wireless network, we have a completely different type of thing. We generally will have a network access card it's a wireless network at risk. In your particular case, you have a computer here. They have computers back over here. They're all wireless because the network card says, I'm going to communicate to a device that allows me to communicate uh, wirelessly. And that's what's called a wireless router. Nope, it's right back there. OK, so the, but way in the back there is your wireless router. See it up at the top of the ceiling? So that allows you to wirelessly connect to that. Now, notice there's a, there's a wire from that router that goes into the ceiling. Everybody see that? Okay, so even though you have a wireless router that connects you from here to there, they generally have a wire that goes from there. So in this particular case, we go to a wireless router, and it might have an antenna, and then we connect with an Ethernet cable to a network interface box or a box, and it becomes a wired network from there on out. In this particular case, that hub would be something that's in your house that connects you back to your cable system, files, or connects you back to your Comcast system, okay? And it might go to a switch, and it might go to a satellite uplink. Um, there's a difference, though, when we talk about the type of wireless network that we use when we talk about using this device. So this device being a what? Is that a remote? That's a phone. Oh, that's, that's a phone. phone. That's a phone. Okay. How many of you have a smartphone? You have a smartphone? 
Do you have a smartphone? Okay, what type of smartphone do you have? Uh, I, I, iPhone. iPhone. I iPhone. <laughs> iPhone. iPhone. So no one has an Android. I have a Windows phone. Okay. <laughs> so. <It's complicated>. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, what? Oh, Samsung. Oh, Samsung? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was so complicated. It was the Android phone. Right? I never, yeah, yeah, I never really learned. I could do it, but right. I didn't learn a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessary for me. Right. So I went back to the iPhone. Went back to the iPhone. Okay. Um, when we talk about connecting via a cell phone or a smartphone, we're talking about connecting to a different type of wireless network. That's what we call a telephone. A, a telephone wireless network. Telephone wireless network is a little bit different than the wireless network that we're talking about here. And what do you what do you think is the big difference between the two? Between, between the wireless network where you connect your computer to that router, to a wireless router, and where your phone connects to a cell phone tower. Difference. What's the difference between the two? In what, how they connect to the well, well, what's the biggest difference when, when you talk about connecting your, 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 your computer or your laptop or your, or your tablet to that particular router and it's in the room as opposed to your phone connecting to a cell phone tower, what's the biggest difference you can tell between those two? Well, you have to, to, to do a computer, you have to go through a network of some sort and to do a uh, to use the phone, you just have to be somewhere near a, a cell phone tower. You have to be near your cell phone tower, okay. Generally, when you connect your computer to a wireless network, how far can you go with that computer before you lose the network connection? Uh, not too far. Right, not too far. <laughs> so you're about 1,500 feet is about what your networks that use the wireless network for your computer can go between a, 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 a router. Whereas your cell phone, you can be how many miles away? Two or three miles away from a cell phone tower. And the reason why is because those wireless networks that your, that your cell phone uses is different than the wireless networks that was used in your, um, your laptop or your... Now, what's happened with our cell phones that had ma has made them smart, as opposed to being a cell phone, as opposed to being a smartphone? One major difference that is really, really part of the digital revolution and the digital transformation and the digital convergence. Well, the, the phones have become small computers. The phones have become small computers, exactly. And can this phone connect to that network up there, to your wireless internet yeah. connection? And it also connects to a cell phone tower. So it has two networks it can connect to now, because guess what? Everything is what? That happens in here is digital. They're both digital networks, okay? So as a result, we now have phones that are smart that if they want to and they're, they're within 1,500 feet of a wireless router, they can connect to that router and connect you to the internet, right? At the same time, if they're not, they can use a cell phone network. What's the difference between the two and what's the benefit of connecting to that network as opposed to connecting to a cell phone network? Visual? Why do you say visual? I'm thinking of a phone that didn't used to be smart. You couldn't really see movies or Okay, TV. okay, so, okay. So a, a smartphone, you can see those types of things as opposed to a non-smartphone. That's one of the capabilities of a smartphone. That's right. What else? Well, to connect to uh, the internet with a phone that's where you're near, not near Wi-Fi, it you have to have a subscription for some Right, so, so one of the things you, you do recognize is that if you're connected to a cell phone wireless network, you have to belong to that cell phone wireless. If you do, if you use a network that you're not a member of, what do we call that? Out of network use. Out of network. network use, right, okay. <laughs> now, now, let me ask you this. If my cell phone connects to a wireless network, that's the internet, and it connects to a cell phone network, that might be that I might belong to a cell phone network that I don't belong to. What's the big difference between the three? What's the major difference between the three? Uh, could 
Okay, if my cell phone can connect to a cell phone network that I belong to, or a cell phone network that I don't belong to, and a wireless internet connection, what's the big difference between those three? See, and, and, and this is something that digital natives understand inherently as opposed to digital visitors. So the key here is this. Every time I connect to this cell phone tower or an in-network or out-of-network, I'm paying for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm paying data for that, okay? okay? And as a result, if I connect this phone to that network up there, do I pay for it? No. That's why you'll find most kids today don't care about having a cell They don't care about the cell phone network because they're always connecting to some internet connection. That's why they always have to have a router next to them. Because they say, I'm not going to pay for it as long as I'm connected to that network. That's where they can watch unlimited amount of movies and all the rest. But if they connect to a cell phone network, you get charged for data. Unless you have an unlimited data plan. Okay? So, some of the things that smart digital natives know is that's a big difference. Okay? And they make sure that they have that capability. And the texting Excuse me? Well, they're all text uses the t cell phone network to text, unless you use an application that doesn't use a cell phone network. And we'll talk about that when we talk about cloud computing in my cloud computing class. One of the big things about it is they use text applications like WhatsApp and all the rest because that uses the internet, okay, as opposed to cell phone network. Okay. So the difference between a computer network and a mobile wireless network is the fact that a mobile wireless network uses a cell phone as opposed to a computer wireless network uses a Wi-Fi router and the, wi and the wireless network here. This is better known as Wi-Fi is, called, is, is really wireless fidelity. It's a specific type of standard to do that, as opposed to, in this particular cell phone capability, we call this a cell phone network. And that cell phone network has its own technology. The technology that we're using today in a cell phone network is what, you know what technology we're using today for cell phone network? So we used to use a technology called GSM. Anybody know it? Ever hear that? So the Global System for Mobile Communications. I'm sure you know about the new technology that's used for cell phone networks called LTE. Have you heard that? LTE? You have an LTE network connection? I've seen those letters. You've seen those letters. So LTE is the network s protocol that's being used for cell phone networks today, and that's called long-term evolution. Long-term evolution. That's the newest one out. And we're getting ready to get, and that's, that's, we also have a way of designating that, LTE means 4G, or fourth generation network. We're getting ready to go to five generation network, which means that the network will be stronger, it'll be, have a lot more capacity, and you'll be able to be farther away, okay? To be able to use that, okay? So that's the big difference between the mobile network, mobile telecommunications net wireless network, and the computer telecommunications wireless network, okay? So, so what's the internet? Series of tubes. <laughs> <laughs> series of tubes. That's a good way of putting it. Very good way. Huh? Connections. Connections. That's another good way of putting it. It's about a connections. Any any other thoughts on what the internet's about? Well, the internet is really the connections and starts off with a very, very simple thing called a LAN. Okay? A LAN. A LAN is called a local area network, okay? A local area network is where we get computers, either wirelessly or with wired, and we link them up together in a small area. So in this particular building, they have a couple computer labs, and that computer lab, all those computers connect together is called a LAN, okay? A local area network. We can have several different labs with computers in several different locations, and they're all connected together called a LAN. The LANs are always connected to a larger network, the larger networks are called a CAN, okay? CANs are called campus area networks. Campus area networks would be like what's connecting this building to the next building, and that's called a campus area network. When we connect these buildings together, it's called a CAN. The next, these networks are also connected together, and those networks are called MANs. MAN standing for Metropolitan Area Network. A Metropolitan Area Network is where we have like all the Gaith Germantown connected together, okay? It's metropolitan, okay? And those metropolitan networks then connect up to larger networks. And those larger networks are called a WAN, or a wide area network. And the wide area networks are those connection points that allow us to connect Gaithersburg 
and Rockville and Washington, D.C. All these networks are connected together. We now have about 14,000 different WANs that are now connected together globally, and all these networks make up the Internet. Because the Internet is the interconnection of devices that allow us to communicate over a short area as well as a wide area. And now, because we also involve wired networks, these can also be wireless networks as well. Because we can have a wireless LAN network, which is what happens with the device that we have up here. It allows us to have a wireless local area network. Okay? But all of it's connected together, and all of that's considered to be the internet. So the internet is the physical stuff that connects us together. So what's the World Wide Web? Isn't that just what I said? The internet's the World Wide Web? Same thing. Same thing? Do you think it's the same? Well, that's it used. Oh, no. The World Wide Web is the information the in outside of that, that the... Okay, it's the information the outside of... Okay. The in well, that the internet connects. The in in connects. Well, the internet, believe it or not, was developed many years ago. It wasn't until later on that the World Wide Web became developed. And the World Wide Web really is the services and the capabilities that are put on top of the internet. Okay? It used to be like arrows and what CompuServe. CompuServe, yeah. Well, CompuServe was a network, but it also had its own arrows, yeah. Executive PC, all the rest of those were AOL. AOL. Okay, AOL. Okay, those were all their own networks. They didn't have the internet back then, they had their own networks and they had their own services that they, so it's kind of all together. And then the internet kind of replaced all of that because it became a, a public network, okay? And the World Wide Web was a way in which we could put stuff on the internet, okay? So we do that by having what we call a client device, okay? A client device is any device that's local that basically needs to get information, okay? And we also have a device connected to this network that is called a server, okay? So in the world of the World Wide Web, we have devices, which could be a desktop, or could be a uh, tablet, it could be a phone, and those client devices are called clients, and our device that's up here is called a server. It's because we have a model, and we have a way in which we provide that information called a client-server model. One of the things that needs to, be, needs to be understood is that the World Wide Web is all about clients request information and servers provide or serve that information back to the clients. So whenever you use the World Wide Web, what you're doing when you click a button or you click a link is you're requesting information. The thing that provides that information, which you wanted to know about, was a server. A server serves it up. And that's all their job is to do is to serve information. And the way in which the World Wide Web works is that information and the services that are there are requested by a client and the server provides them back. And the means to get that done, the telecommunications means, is called the what? Cloud. The cloud. Well, 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 the cloud is both the services and also the telecommunications means. What was the telecommunications devices and things that we call? We call the devices that are connected together as what? The internet. Oh, those. the internet, the internet. internet. So the internet is all the devices and all the connections, whereas as opposed to services that are provided over the internet is um, the World Wide Web. And the World Wide Web and the internet together is cloud computing, is the cloud computing, okay? So, yeah. What were, the first time I ever went on the internet before the World Wide Web, and I wasn't on CompuServe, I was on something called Gopher. Gopher, yeah. right. So did you use Gopher and Archie and and, and, and Just Veronica? a little bit. Right, right. Um, so Gopher, Gopher was the old protocol that was used to be able to do um, uh, to be able to do talking, like chatting, between different devices that were on the internet. So we used to have another thing called Archie and Veronica, yeah, which was the be, and which was be able to do file transfer protocol was a file transfer protocol. And that allowed us to do certain other things on the internet before we had the World Wide Web. And that was called the internet. That yeah, that was, was called the and that was, that was called the internet. And those were internet protocols. Okay, those were internet 
in internet rules are how things got done before the World Wide Web came around. Because the World Wide Web didn't get created until 1996. The internet was around way before that. Okay. So, okay. right. Yes. The server. Mm -hmm. Does it serves? But what's in it? What's in it? Oh, okay. So what's in the server? Well, number one, it's a digital computing device. So a digital computing device has certain capabilities. One of the big things it has, it has what's known as a microprocessor. A microprocessor processes digital information. And what that allows it to do is to say, look, if I have digital information, I have to store it someplace. And if I want to get it from that storage, I need to be able to take it and then create what I need to create and send it out. So one of the things a server does, okay, in this, in this scenario for World Wide Web, is the World Wide Web breaks on, works on what we call standards. And the group that does those standards is called the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. The internet has its own standards group called the Internet Engineering Task Force, or the IETF. Okay? The thing about it is that the World Wide Web, the server, in order for it to communicate to these clients, has to format that information in a specific way for the clients to understand it and to present it to you, the user. When we surf the web, what are we usually using to surf the web? When we go out to the web and we use, we use something to, 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 to look at information from the web. What do we generally use? We use an application to get that done. What's the application we might use? Is Google an application? Google is, Google is a service, service on the internet. Of but it's not the, is. excuse me? Google is a service. Google is a service, not a server. Service. service, okay? Google is a service, okay? But all of you, whenever you go on the web, you have to open up a specific type of application. What's the application that you open up to like surf the web? Explorer. Explorer, right? Or like, Mozilla okay. or yeah. Firefox. How many of you use Chrome? Okay, you might use Chrome. That's what's known as a what? A browser. A browser, okay? A browser is what we use to surf the World Wide Web. And the reason why is because the browser is made up and uses specific protocols or specific languages, okay? And those languages allow us to present stuff on a screen. So when I go to a website, like my website, just quickly go over. So this particular browser that I'm using right now is um, Firefox. And if I go to my website and I click on anything here, it allows me to display this information via the browser. I could also open this up in Chrome. I could open up in Opera. If you have an Apple device, what type of, what are you using? Safari. <laughs> okay. So that's a browser for the yes. Apple. Okay. <laughs> okay. You, you can use Chrome as well. Okay. But, but. Safari comes standard for yeah. Apple devices. The thing about it is that in order for this information to be presented to you, it has to be converted into usable, presentable information. Now, you want to see what this information looks like that comes from a server? And so if I go to this page, and I right-click on it, and what it's going to do is it's going to say, um, show me the source. So this is the actual source of the page. And that's what we call code. And what web designers do is they code stuff so it's like that. And what the web server has to do is the web server has to go through and says, oh, this is the code? I have to interpret that, and I have to format it specifically so it can be presented to you, the individual consumer that's using the browser. So when it's presented to you, it looks like this. But the server makes it what uses this. <laughs> It is a lot of work, okay? The servers do a lot of tremendous work because every time you request information, every time you click a link, every time you click a button, the server has to then say, what do they want? What did they request? And let me format that and send it back to them so they can see it. And that has to be done how fast? <laughs> really fast, okay? So we have to make sure the networks are working right. We have to make sure the servers are working right. We have to make sure all that. And it's all done through what type of technology? Digital. It's all digital. It's all digital. OK? It's all digital. And now our videos and our audios and our songs and all that is also digital. So everything's been converted to digital because it makes it easier for us to transport it and easy enough to move it around and to use it and to convert it and, and to provide it. Okay? So one of the things that's happened over the years, from the 80s until today, is that we had many dice separate networks that were uh, 
allowing us to have different services provided to them. So before we used to have things like the television on a separate network, newspapers were differently provisioned, radio, books, magazines, music, video games, and movies. All of them had their own delivery platform, okay? So in the 80s, the way we saw movies was how? Uh, went to the movie went, theaters. Went to the movie theaters, okay? Went to the movie theaters, and that's the way we, 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 we sourced them. Through television. Or, t or through television. But it, it was broadcast TV, and, or it could have been a cable channel, like something like that. But it was primarily over our own platform. Radio was the same way. If we wanted to, get, if we wanted to look at books, um, we really didn't have audio books on tape back then, did we? So what did you have to do? You had to go to the library or, or uh, right, and purchase them, okay? So starting in the 90s, some significant things happened, and what the significant things was is we were able to have computing devices, were able to digitize more and more information. And the reason for that is because we now had applications like Microsoft Word and Adobe to be able to take the printed word and make that into a digital version. Once we could make a digital version out and it's digital, it could go on any platform that had a digital capability digital telecommunications network. So in the 90s, we started to see the convergence of all these different types of information services being converged into one network. And the one network that happened was really didn't come into existence until the, until the 2000s, was when the internet became the public network, the, and it's all the hardware and software, all the hardware and the telecommunications networks to come together. And then, of course, in 1996, the browser was created. The browser allowed us to have this new capability called the World Wide Web provide us. And since that time period, since the World Wide Web has been put in place and the networks have gotten faster and wireless has become available for every type of device, what's happened is that now we have digital broadcasting, the internet, and now we have all of them converging onto one network. Since 2010, everything runs on the internet. So when you pick up your phone today, and you make a telephone call from your house. How many of you have a home phone? Home phone? Yeah. Home phone? Home, home phone? Landline. Landline. A landline. You have a landline, right? A, a, lamp, a home phone. Uh -huh. You have a home phone, right? Uh -huh. Okay. How many of you have a cell phone? Okay. Now, digital natives? No landline. Digital natives? Digital natives. People who are born in the digital age, they don't believe in landlines. They only have what? A cell phone. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they look at it as, a, as an expense they don't have to pay for because guess what? But when you pick up your cell phone, when you pick up your landline, it used to be analog, right? Is it digital now? Yeah. You think it is? I don't know. I don't know. You, it seems to me that uh, you can use a phone when you're power goes off. Does that have anything to do with anything? Well, you can use the phone when the power goes off because the lines are still charged, okay? And most of your, even new services allow you to have that capability. But what has happened is that when we used an analog old, what we call the plain, the POT system, the plain old television, t telephone system, which was before it became digital, our analog phones were all analog, and it was a wave phone, basically. So wave go out, come back in, people would talk via that way. Now that everything is digitized, we actually have our phone service, when you talk into it, it's an analog wave that gets digitized using a specific thing. You might have heard about the specific capability to get that done. It's called VOIP. Anyone, anyone ever heard of that? It's called Voice Over the Internet Protocol. And the reason why is because that's the digital conversion of an analog voice and it's over the internet, which means that it's all dropped into the internet now. So there is no public telephone switching network. There's no old POTS system. It's all the internet now. So when you're talking to your phone at home, it's the internet. Well, if you're talking to your cell phone, where's it going to end up at? The internet. <laughs> okay? So why have two different devices that does the same features? They all end up on the same. One you pay for one and one you pay for again. So it's a myth that you can still have a phone connected in your house if there's a storm and everything goes out. And they used to say you would have a, a phone connected no more. 
Basic, basically, it's all a digital phone system. Yeah, okay. see that? Then well, it does work. It, it does work. It does. It does. It does work as long as your as long as your internet line or your telephone line or your FiOS line or your cable Comcast line. You have Comcast uh, phone. Yeah, your no. phone is. Yeah. Yeah, you do have Comcast phone. So your Comcast phone is a VoIP phone service. Okay. Your FiOS is a VoIP phone service. But if everything goes down in the house. Well, it, it depends upon everything. When we say everything goes down in the house, if you in fact lose your service because of a down line or the wire breaks, now you're not, not going to have phone service. That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you still don't have phone service. Okay. So, but what's happened though is all of these now have been converged. So one of the things. When, that you look at when you when you look at your television today, what are you actually looking at? The internet. The internet. That's right. You're looking at the internet, okay? Because it's all been converted. Because if you, how do you get your television service right now at home? Uh, uh, Xfinity. Xfinity. Bios. Bios. Okay. So you have cable TV. Cable TV. Cable TV. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about cable TV and this whole what we call. So we have a system that's called, we did a transition back a little while ago, which is called the Digital Broadcasting System Transition. Anybody know what happened during that time period? When we transitioned? Broadcast. We went to the Digital Broadcasting System as opposed to an Analog Broadcasting System. So when we went to the Digital Broadcasting System, what happened? We had like hundreds of stations. We, 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 we did have a major increase in the amount of stations. And the reason being is this. So when we had, excuse me, when we had the Analog Phone System, Previously, the analog, I mean, analog TV system, you only could have one station per channel because it was an analog system. So we had like CBS and ABC and NBC and Channel 4. When we went to the digital broadcast system, system the digital broadcasting system said, look, we now have enough space in the air to allow you to have up to seven channels of information. Because when we digitize it, we can put it in different ways and we make it in different ways. And we can give you up to seven channels, okay? Or we can give you one, what they call high definition channel. So in fact, each station that used to be one channel could either have seven channels or could they have one high definition channel. And that actually got broken down to, well, we can give you a high definition channel plus three standard definition channels. So what happened is that when the digital transition went on, it said, look, Instead of just broadcasting one channel, we're going to broadcast five channels. So if you take a look at PBS here in, in, in Maryland, how many PBS channels do you have on the air, over the air? Well, you know, different places like D.C., Baltimore. Well, true, true. But for, for, for Maryland public TV, how many channels do you have? You have five channels. Definition and standard. Right, yeah. You have one high def, and you have four standard definition channels for the Maryland public TV systems for a total of five channels available, okay? But do they uh, broadcast different things on the other four? Yeah, because one has PBS Kids, one has, one has, one has PBS uh, El Mundo, one has PBS British, and there's a couple other things that are also done, okay? So each channel has their own little separate thing. But we couldn't do that before because under the analog broadcasting system, we only have one channel. Under the digital, we can have multiple channels. So what did that do, do you think? What happened? overnight to the amount of channels that were available on broadcast TV? A lot of advertising. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. No, you're right. You're right. Not a lot more advertising. Yes, but, yeah. but a lot more channels. A lot more channels, okay? So we now have 108 digital TV channels in the Washington, D.C. area that you can pick up. The difference is that because it's a digital channel and because the frequency is much smaller, you have to have a specialized antenna to get those 108 channels. You actually have to have an, a directional antenna to get those channels. Now, your cable company also provides those channels, okay? That's the 102 channels that you get at the, at the 100, 200 level. But they also provide another 400 channels as well, okay? But most other channels you have on a cable TV system are also available to you where? To uh, computer? On your computer. And if it's on your computer, where is it available? Where is it being provided from? The internet. The internet. So kids today, digital natives, have said, look, why should I pay $200 for a cable TV system when I, in fact, can get everything I need to get on the internet or through broadcast TV for free? Okay. 
that's another change between digital natives and digital visitors. They understand that, 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 that issue. Because everything that we now know is converged on one network called the internet. Okay? So that's one reason why digital convergence has had such a major impact on what's happening. So the IoT, the Internet of Things, what do you think that's about? Well, let's think about it. If we're going to digitize everything that's in the world, is there anything that we might digitize that generally wasn't there before that might be on the Internet? Is there anything else that we might be wanting to, to, to have available to us in terms of information? Information? Information. What type of information that we haven't covered already in this class that we might want to have available to us? Okay. Let's think about a couple different things. So to get here today, how many of you took a roadway? Oh. A roadway. A road. A drove. How many of you took a drove? Okay. Did anyone take um, any toll lanes to get here? Any toll lanes? Yeah. Nobody used like 200? Or um, <coughs> has anyone driven in Virginia and used a toll road? <coughs> anyone, if, you, if, you, if you're from New York and you drive to New York, you got toll roads. New Jersey's just one big toll road, right? So if you're going to use a toll road, what do you generally use to get your tolls paid? Well, you can use money or you can use money. easy pass. You can use easy pass. So what is easy pass? The internet. <laughs> What, what do we call easy pass? Is it specific? Does anybody, anybody know what the name of that item is? An easy pass is what we call an RI, RFID device, a radio frequency identification device. Okay? And an RFID device allows us to have the ability to, in fact, collect information from different places. So one of the big things that was the first uses of an RFID tag was the easy pass. But one of the things that's happening is that if you take a look at any of your items you might have here, notice that if, if you pick up um, a product that you might buy, so this is, this is my product that I bought this afternoon, it is a um, bottle of Dr. Pepper, okay? And what do we notice about this particular bottle of Dr. Pepper? It's got a code, it's got a code okay? What's, what is that code? What is that code known as? A barcode or UPC code, okay? A UPC code. So one of the things happening is that fact that in the near future, in fact, you might find that most of your, some of your uh, items that you're purchasing has a small little chip in it. Notice if you bought any books recently, you have a chip in the, in the book. But that chip is called an, is an RFID chip, a radio frequency identification tag book, a chip. And what that chip allows them to do is to put information on it about that particular item you're purchasing. And what happens is that when you go to the store, you'll be able to scan that item or go through a scanner and it'll automatically total up everything in your shopping cart, okay? So that you don't have to actually go through and have to go through a cashier to, to scan it. It'll do that with the RFID chip, and you just go up and you pay what's in your cart. So that's one of the big things that's going to happen. But all that information from that chip has to be put someplace. What do you think is going to be put it on? On a network. What network do you think is going to be put it on? The internet. internet. <laughs> that one, exactly, okay? So that's just one utilization of this new thing that we call the Internet of Things. There will be more, okay? And the reason being is because of this. So what is this? That's a smartwatch? A, a what? A, a, a smartwatch. A smartwatch, okay? It's a smartwatch. This is actually a, 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 a Fitbit. The Fitbit does what? You have a Fitbit. Tell me what it does for you. Well, this is a, uh, I had a Fitbit. This is a, a, an actual watch. Oh, well, an actual watch? I had an old-fashioned Oh, yeah, Fitbit. okay, okay. This is an Apple. Oh, that's an Apple watch. Yeah. Okay, but app, doesn't it do... Um, it does the same thing. Same it thing, tells right. you how much you, uh, energy you've expended in all kinds of ways. You can set it up. It has, I think, I don't, I, there are whole books on how to use this. <laughs> I only know, you, you can put pictures on it. Um, you can find different kinds of, it's a computer. It's a little small <laughs> mini computer, okay? It's a little small mini computer. So let me ask you this. With that watch, does that connect to an app? On your computer? It, there is an app. There is an app. There is an app. So the app actually it talks back and forth. How do you think it does that? Hmm? How do you think it does that? How does that? Wi Fi. <laughs> <laughs> wi Fi, right? Wi Fi. But Wi Fi is part of what? The cloud. The cloud and the internet. Okay. okay. So when we talk about these devices, these wearable devices that give us feedback about our health, 
those devices will now be on there. And it's really good because if you have, uh, um, if you have uh, parents that are older and you want to be able to keep a health monitoring check on them and you want to give them emergency service capability, all that can be done now through your app. Does anybody have a security system at their house? Okay, you have a security system? You, you did? did? Um, ADT or something like that? ADT. So ADT is another big thing, but now we actually have home security surveillance capabilities. We can go out and buy a package, install cameras, and you can see your house over the internet 24-7, 365, because we have those, that type of surveillance capability. What's it called again? Home surveillance. Home surveillance systems, okay? One of my friends has one for his house, and I, I haven't gone that, that far yet, but he has one. And I mean, it, it's amazing what you can get done. The other thing that's also going to happen is the fact that how many have seen the new GE uh, home, uh, the new GE home refrigerator that's internet enabled? So one of the nice things about the GE home internet enabled refrigerator is the fact that it in fact takes a look at what products you have in your refrigerator and prints out a list of all your shopping cart items that you need to go shopping for. And then if you want to, you can push that list to a, uh, um, a grocer who, in fact, then can use Peapod to have it delivered to your house. Okay? And all that has been done how? Over the internet. So when we talk about the internet of things, we talk about the ability to have not only our computers, which are connected, and our computing devices, which are connected, we'll have new different types of devices like this. Anybody know what this is? It looks like a scale, doesn't it? It's actually the Nest thermostat. Okay, the Nest thermostat. You have that. <laughs> Tell me about it. How do you like it? We just got it a couple of weeks ago. Our son installed it. Uh, I know it does a lot of things, but I only know one right now, and that's the temperature. <laughs> but it, with it, you can do a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what all, but you can ask it questions. That I think it plays music. But basically, I say it's getting cold, and I, I ask Alexa. Okay. Alexa is the nest set at seventy-five, or please set it at seventy-four. That sort of thing. And you tell Alexa it. to set that. I said it to Alexa. I say it to Alexa. See now, what, what what did she just do? She said to a personal virtual assistant, "Please set my temperature in my house to seventy-five degrees." It, in turn, is talking directly to your Nest thermostat and lower and increasing the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, temperature. In I the have house. to say Nest for some reason. Right, right. Because it also regulates the one in my son's house. <laughs> 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 and if I don't say Nest, it says, well, John has two houses, and which one, da da da. So I have to say Nest. Good, good. So certain words are so all of that's connected via the what? The internet. Okay. So um, this is the G um, refrigerator that you can now program to do certain things and keep track of all your groceries that you need to buy and, and those types of things. And it'll actually contact a grocer. So if you if you belong to Peapod, it'll actually contact the grocer. The Peapod will then deliver it to your house in the in, in, in whatever time they need to have. I talked about vehicle telematics. One of the big things that's happening today is the fact that we now have the ability for our vehicles to not only be uh, transportation vehicles, but to also be smart enough to let you know everything that's going on. How many people have a vehicle that uses visual, uh, uses a vehicle c a collision avoidance? Okay, so what, tell, tell me about your vehicle. Um, well, actually, it, it, um, it beeps if you're getting close to a car, okay. cars getting close to you. So your new vehicles have the sensors built in, and those sensors allow you to know. That, and do you, you, you understand why that's a really, really important, significant new technology for vehicles going forward? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I mean, um, I only know the obvious things, so you don't scrape the car next to you. Right. Hit it. Right. Go over a lane. Get too close to it. Consider, um, considering what a self-driving car needs to be able to, um, yeah. it needs to be aware of all the things around you, and therefore those vehicle sensors that are there now that beep, it allow a automated system to know I'm moving into a lane and should avoid that. So the vehicle avoidance things 
are part of the ability for cars to be self-driving very, very soon. And what you're doing is you're testing that out for the, for the automobile makers to make sure that that capability works. And all of that data that you're generating as a result of your driving that car is doing what? Being used back at the manufacturers to, in fact, test and make sure it's done. And how is that data being communicated with them through the telematic devices that are in the car? Through the Internet of Things. There's a technology that probably doesn't have anything to do with this that I don't understand, which is like a 3D printer. Does that have anything to do with? <coughs> yes, it does. It has a lot to do with it. Why, why would a 3D Why would a 3D printer be important for us going forward, especially for the Internet of Things? I, I still don't understand it. Okay. I mean, I, so a 3D I, printer basically says, look. I can take the specifications of any, anything that I want to build, and a 3D printer, well, what does a printer do for us? A printer can print out what? Copy. A copy of what? Some, a paper or? A paper copy of whatever the pictorial identification is, OK? Unless well, it's speech. Hmm? Some letters speak. Well, the, the well let, a 3D printer is going to print things three-dimensionally. So that means if I'm going to print things three-dimensionally, if I can take a three-dimensional picture of something that I want to have, a 3D printer should then be able to reproduce that down to the exact infinite detail. If I'm able to take a 3D copy of it, I can then make a 3D print of it, given that I have the right materials to get that done. A 3D? You put the materials somewhere. You put the materials in the printer, and the printer then copies that three-dimensional object down to its finite detail. Because we now have the ability to do three-dimensional imaging, and we can then do three-dimensional reproduction. And the nice thing about it is that we're doing that today, particularly when we talk about doing, um, uh, when we talk about doing anything to do with um, health care and heart, and heart uh, transplants and heart um, uh, operations. The company that owns that technology is out of Israel, and the universities around the, the universities around the world that now have that capability are, are providing that 3D imaging capability. It's being sent to different hospitals. John Hopkins is one of them, where they actually print that out and print out a, a, a heart to examine and to affect uh, do, do do tests on. So that's that's a real example of that 3D printing capability having an impact on the Internet of Things, because we can now use that to, in fact, um, with, with all the imaging now, we can now send that around. In fact, the radiologist doesn't generally sit in a hospital. The radiologist sits back in a different office and reads those imaging as we need to have, because of the Internet of Things. Okay. Um, anybody know what telephone with cameras on it? We talked about the, uh, we talked about the Fitbit being another item. We talked about, or we haven't talked about this. This is the emergency alert system, okay, that, that connects directly to the network in your home that alerts you if a person has a fall. How about these things up here? Anybody ever seen one of those? We're going to get a whole bunch of them in the near, in the near future. Is that, oh, that's, that's a yeah. drone. That's a drone. The drone that's a drone. drone. Amazon That's, says they're going to use yeah. for Amazon. Amazon is yeah. going to be using that. So one of the yeah. big things that it needs to be, it needs to be able to do aerial navigation. Okay? But there's some other interesting impacts about drone technology, which I've been talking about in terms of, so how many of you are your homeowner, homeowner, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now, so when you talk about drone technology and talk about home ownership, would you think there's a problem there? There is an is a intersection between drone technology and home ownership? Would you, you think so? A technology? Yeah, a, an intersection between drone use and home ownership. See, this is where digital technology really, really impacts you. As, so one of the things that's happened is that the FC, FAA, the Federal uh, Aviation Administration, has said drones can be used anywhere in the, world, in the country, and it's up, they can only fly up to 500 feet. Because above 500 feet is what we call the international or the national airspace, okay? And they control that use for commercial airlines. So who owns between the ground or the top of a structure to 500 feet? The 
the homeowner. And they've now appropriated that airspace for use for drones. So the question comes in, and drones have to keep a digital record of what's going on with all their flights. Should they be given air rights over homeowners' properties, or should they be using public airways? And can we track that? Interesting. But a digital technology, nonetheless, allows us to track all of their flights. Okay? And it's all put on what? The Internet of Things. <laughs> okay. So um, RFID, I already told you that's the one big item that's out there, radio frequency identification devices. And it's just not there. One of the things that's going to happen is that uh, right now we're here in Germantown. I see a lot of us have bought sodas from the machine over there. Okay. But wouldn't it be great? See, one of the things I do when I work with businesses is I say, how can you maximize your profits? Okay. Well, if it's a hot day and it's, 300, you know, it's, it's 102 degrees outside, what you really should do is increase the price of your beverages by five cents for every five degree change. And that way, when people come to buy a good water or whatever it is, they're charged 35 cents instead of 25 cents because it's a hotter day. On a colder day, when they're not consuming as much better, you want to be able to lower that price. So say, all right, I'm going to sell it for 75 cents instead of $1.25. Well, you see, one of the big things that's happening now is all of those vending machines are now being internet connected. So in fact, pricing will be able to change and be dynamic pricing for all of those items that are going to be out done. And, now, uh, and the reason why is because the Internet of Things, the Internet allows you to connect all those things wirelessly and wired so that we can do the, those changes. And, it, and the RFID chip that's going to be connected to each one, of those, the, each one of those items will be able to change the pricing as based upon demand pricing. Okay. So that's how our... Well, when they have sales at the drugstore, exactly. they change the prices on the... Exactly. And the chips, the chips allow us to. The chips allow um, um, merchants to keep better track of their inventory, and as a result, a lot less inventory walks out the door at 12 o'clock at night. <laughs> as a result of that, okay. Um, so that's one of the other big things. So. Good question. Good, good, good question. Good question is, you know, what, what about when you start using biometric? Uh, digital information to, in fact, secure certain things. And although that's a great question, I have a class that we specifically talk about biometric uh, digital security issues uh, in, in the digital security class. So to review, what we reviewed is we defined what digital technology is. We defined uh, what digital literacy is. We identified the key things that you need to know about digital technology and why it's important to you today. We talked about the trans transformation drivers, what's driving everything as far as that's concerned. We talked about how it impacts on your life, how it can enhance your lifestyle going forward, what's the difference between a wired and a wireless network, and the devices that are involved in providing that. We also talked about the difference between a telecommunications wireless network and a computer wireless network, and what's the difference between the two. We talked about the impact of digital convergence and what digital convergence is doing to you and, 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 and the items that are available for you. And then we talked about the World Wide Web, the cloud, and the Internet of Things. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.